um, we'll, get, um, we'll get started. We're basically carrying over the, um, the breakout from the end of Joey's last lecture to the end of my lecture. Um, and that should give you a good enough introduction uh, into object oriented programming. And then um, for your homework uh, tonight, you'll sort of get into some of the more nitty gritty of, of object oriented programming that I'll be, uh, that I'll be presenting now. Um, the most interesting man in the universe. Doesn't always program in Python, but when he does, it's usually object oriented. Um, we talked about building up classes, and in particular, starting a bear population. Now we're going to be talking about killing bears and other fun things we can do to uh, instances. <coughs> We've already seen um, an interesting method, a uh, special method within a class. And that was this underscore underscore init. There is the reciprocal of that, the underscore underscore del. And that's, you can think of as a teardown that happens as you're sort of cleaning things up. So if you instantiate a, uh, in, uh, basically an instance of uh, some class, and you do something with it, and then you delete it, or you quit, uh, you're actually tearing down that class. And if there is a del um, uh, instance, that, uh, sorry, del method, which is uh, defined, then it will wind up getting called upon the teardown. So that's the important point about init, right, is that when you create an instantiation of a class, that is just called for you because that's just how the Python language works. You didn't have to say, create this variable, it's going to be of this class, and while you're at it, why don't you also call underscore underscore unit? That just sort of all happens for you as you're doing it. So um, there's a, a notebook version of all the code that I'll be showing here. Um, you can just cut and paste directly from, uh, from, the, from the PDF slides of this lecture as well, if you'd like. Um, we're going to create a little class called bear. And it's likewise, as we had before, going to have an init function, or init method associated with it. And this is just going to take a single argument, even though it looks like there's two. We learned about self before. It's going to take a single argument name, and then it's just going to say, I made a bear called whatever. But in addition to this, we're going to create uh, this underscore underscore del. And it's going to take no arguments. In fact, dels are not allowed to take arguments. Bang. That thing is no longer. And let's see what happens when I create a variable um, uh, that's pointing to an instance of, um, of Yogi Bear. And then we'll also have C, which is pointing to Cal Bear. So we see made a bear called Yogi, made a bear called Cal. All this makes sense also in the order in which this happened. This thing on the left got executed before this thing on the right. So you've seen that before. I can delete out of my namespace those variables. And we implicitly call the teardown function a teardown method underscore underscore del. Um, note here I'm going to create a, a variable called y, which is pointing to an instance of a bear called yogi. And then I'm going to create uh, another variable called y, um, which will be pointing to an instance of a bear called cal. Um, what do you think happens here? Well, I'm going to create Yogi, so I'm going to wind up saying I made Yogi. Then I'm also um, uh, creating a bear called Cal, but in assigning it to Y, I had to take down what this original Y was pointing to, so I had to kill off uh, Yogi to do that. Is that clear the ordering in which that happened? Uh, good point. So the question is, why is the init happening before the del? Does one, somebody want to construct a reason for me? Yes. Instantiation first, and then does the assignment which waters. Yeah. So you're actually instantiating. So you're setting the whole thing up. You're putting it in memory. You're establishing this thing as an object. And at the very last step, you're saying, oh yeah, and this thing called y is pointing to that. So in the creation of this thing, you are building up cal. But then to assign it to Y, you have to tear down this original Y and now point it to the new one. If I say uh, fuzzy bear, and I then wind up exiting, what do you think winds up happening? I had to kill off fuzzy and cow because they were both in my knees. 
Okay? So even though I quit out of Python, in the process of tearing down Python, Python is saying, oh, you've got these things, I, you've got these objects that have these del uh, methods on them. I better just do that. Yes? Y is equal to bear yogi, yeah. No, so that when an init is something that's special, and whenever you create an instance of a class, it will always get called. Upon you can think of an init as an initialization, right? And so it's an initialization that always happens. And this would have failed if I called bear without uh, an argument here. It would have said, "Oh no, there's something's wrong here." Because just think of this as basically like a special function, even though it's a method. But um, if you call uh, a function without the proper number of arguments, it's going to complain. You'll, get, you'll throw an error. Uh, here's some important things about these special functions. Init and del are not allowed to return anything. So if you say return, cool, I started up. Uh, that's not going to be allowed. In fact, it probably won't even, a Python interpreter won't even allow you to sort of compile that um, little block of code because it knows that it's not allowed to return anything. So you notice up here there's no return statement and there's no return statement. If you really want to return something upon creation, you have to actually force it to do that. But the init function, init method itself, is not allowed to do it. Um, in the tarball that is on the website, uh, on the agenda, you will see um, this uh, long file here called bear.py. And um, we're going to sort of start playing with different pieces of this. Let me just point out a couple of things. Number one is that we've got two attributes that are part of the bear class and belong to the entire bear class. We've got what we're going to call a log file, and we've got the total number of bears in the population. You've seen parts of this before. We've got a huge init. Right, so this gets called upon instantiation of a new, um, uh, a, a new object. Um, and we've got a whole teardown here. I also have a way of growling, which is the poor man's way of, uh, of a bear growling from a Unix command line. Um, let's see what happens. So uh, from bear, import star. Or if you're in IPython, you could say run bear. And now the capital bear class is in your, um, is in your namespace. So just like before, A equals bear yogi. So I made a bear called yogi. B, bear fuzzy, made a bear called fuzzy. And now I can print out the bear nun. Um, I should show you, maybe it's helpful to just have this code up as well. So I don't have to keep going back and forth. Oops. So here is, um, here is bear. And what are we doing upon instantiation? Well, we're opening up a log file um, here. And we know what that log file name is here, because it's an attribute of the entire class called bear. I'm bumping up the population. I'm writing my number, which is my, essentially the current population. It's the ID, as we were mentioning in the last, uh, the last lecture, writing something into log file. And likewise, upon teardown, I'm decrementing um, the total number of bears in the bear population. So I've made two bears. What's that? Bear.py is part of the tarball that, is, um, that should be there if you reload the agenda page. If it's not, let me know, but I think, I think it should be there. Now the bear population is two. If I delete uh, uh, Yogi and, um, and Fuzzy, it's no longer. Bear population is zero. Okay. So I did something slightly non-trivial in the teardown. And I also built up my log, my logger. So I have uh, a nice sort of log of what, what I did inside of this class. So that's pretty nice. I think I have that there. So I created two bears. I deleted a bear. I know the bear number, et cetera, et cetera, right? By the way, you can imagine that um, you don't have to sort of open up your own log file and uh, basically write to it with all these. Um, this is basically just asking what the date time is. Um, Python has a module for doing this. It's called logging. 
So don't create your own log files like I just did. Just look at the logger, uh, the logging uh, module. Besides uh, del and init, there's uh, some other special functions. And one which we'll talk about now is the underscore underscore str. You can guess what this means. Every time somebody says str, the instance of that class, this is a method which actually gets called that decides how to respond with how it should be printed. Right? So the date time, as I showed in the last uh, slide, um, is saved as basically you know, the, wh whatever the current date time is or whatever that instance of a date time object is, is saved with attributes like year, uh, month, uh, microsecond, etc. But when you print out the instance of a date time object, it prints it out nicely and shows you, like I saw in the last slide, kind of a nice formatted version of the date and the time. That's because within the daytime um, uh, module itself, somewhere inside of a class, there is this underscore underscore str, which says, hey, when I get asked to become a string, represent yourself like this. We'll see a little bit more of this in a second. So if I have inside of the bear.py file, return, so you notice I'm not printing it out, I'm just returning a string, and that's the requirement of an underscore underscore str. Name is this, bear is this, um, and what the current population is. So B equals bear, fuzzy, made a bear called fuzzy, print B, name equals fuzzy bear number one, population one. Bear yogi, and you notice uh, population um, two. I don't know why the bear number didn't get off that. That must, have, that, that's, that's an error. Um, exit out of that. As I said, this is sort of the kind of thing that daytime string is doing. You can return anything you want, right? It doesn't have to just be pulling in attributes. For all you know, it could go off and do some major computation and then come back and then return. Um, if we didn't do this and we didn't have an underscore underscore str, Python tries its best to make something that it thinks you might want to see about that object. Um, there's a slightly modified version of that in the archive. Um, called bear2.py. And here, we're going to add all the other stuff we had before, but we're going to add another attribute of um, this one instance, which will be called created. And I'm going to save the moment at which that, uh, that object was created, that instance was created. And when I do my printing, I'm going to now sort of print out the age. And of course, this is dynamic. So you can imagine I say print th this bear, and every time I say this, then the age is going to wind up changing, right? So print doesn't even have to be a static response. It can be a response that's dynamic. From bear2, import star. A equals bear yogi. Made a bear called yogi. Print A. Name equals bear yogi. And it's 11 seconds old. If I do it again and again, you see that the age is getting longer and longer. And of course, you don't have to say whatever the date time string representation is of age, right? Because here I'm saying uh, percent site s, and age is of type what? Does anyone remember what type that is? When I subtract two date time objects? It's a time delta, exactly. So the time delta itself also has an underscore, underscore str. You could say, I only want to know how old it is in microseconds, and then you have to do a little bit of math in here before you print this out. So, there's lots and lots of special methods that live inside of objects. And here are some of them. These are the ones that are related to operations of one object onto another object. When you say one or list one plus list two, it, and then you want to get a response, there's something sensible that comes out of that because whoever was programming um, what a list is as the concept of an object has the concept of addition. And whenever you do a plus in Python, that's the equivalent of saying add these two things together. right? And if it's an object and you've actually told it what, uh, what addition actually means, then um, you're you're essentially re responding back with something that's valid. So we see some of these things overloaded in another file called bear1.py. And um, it doesn't have all the same features as the previous ones. I don't think it has anything with the STR. 
but here it has the in it as before, so here's the bare number. Is everyone clear why we're using bare here and self here? Okay. Um, and now we have the concept of an addition. And other, this is how this thing has to be called. You see how these things have to be called. You're basically giving it another um, instance of the same class. So I'm going to spit. I'm going to spawn a little bear type, or cub is equal to bear, and I'm going to give it a name progeny of the name of this object itself and the name of the other object. And then I'm going to say it's parents, so I'm going to overload an attribute of this instance called cub, uh, will be self and other. So these aren't actually names of those parents. These are more or less pointers to those parents. Yeah? So if other is assumed to be the same class, what if you want to multiply it by two? Yeah, so I think multiply, um, there's like an R. It's not, it's not up here. I forget that what that's called. It's called like uh, numerical multiply or something like that. Here I do do a multiply, right? And here adding and multiplying for, for bears just sort of makes sense that it's pretty much the same thing. It's, it's normal procreation. So here we're just basically responding back with, uh, don't redefine all this stuff, just do whatever add does. So now if I had Yogi times fuzzy, although that'd be interesting, um, then you get something out of that, uh, it'd be exactly the same response if I said Yogi plus fuzzy. Yogi plus Fuzzy, <laughs> I forgot about that. Um, okay, so we made Yogi and Fuzzy. They're gonna have a kid, uh, Y plus C, and I made a bear called Progeny of Yogi and Fuzzy, and if I do R kid dot and I do uh, tab, now I get to see all the things that are available to me because R kid is an instance of the bear class. And you see I've got an add in here, I've got some other interesting stuff which we'll talk about later, and I've also got bear num, my kid, and, uh, and name. Yeah? How would you do that if you were in the terminal version? In the terminal version, you might be able to get away with it with, by saying help, um, and then uh, help our kid. But this is one of the nice things that IPython is exposing to us, to be able to sort of do this as we're, um, as we're programming. And then we also have parents. So our kid dot parents. Do you think this says Yogi and Fuzzy? First of all, what do you think the type of our kids dot parents is? The tuple, right? Because that's how we just def that's how we define what the our parents attribute was, and indeed it is a tuple, and it is essentially showing you an str of those objects. And because we didn't define an underscore underscore str of those objects, we're basically just doing whatever Python gives us. And this is more or less pointers. This is just telling us this is a pointer somewhere in memory. Our kid dot parents zero, so the first one, uh, dot name. I called this one first, that's Yogi. I called the second one second, and that's fuzzy. Likewise, our kid one equals y uh, times c, and we basically made the same thing. Is this, by the way, the same exact instance as um, this, uh, this one up here? No. It's going to live in a different place in memory. It has no idea that I'm not allowed to have conflicting names of bears and stuff like that. Here's some other useful functions, underscore, underscore, dict. That's a dictionary containing the class's namespace. So essentially all the, all the globals within the namespace of that class the doc string associated with that, the name of the class. So if you need to know the name of the class and you've just been handed an instance, you can get access to that with the underscore underscore name. Module, module name in which the class is defined. And that attribute is called underscore underscore main if you're in interactive mode. Bases, um, a tuple uh, containing the base classes. We'll talk a little bit about base classes in a little bit. Um, here's a doc string. Simple class to show off usage of special methods. Here's the name, it's a bare module. I did this from the command line. And here are the bases, they're none. Um, here's the dictionary. So these are basically everything that's available inside of the namespace. And you notice, for instance, interestingly, like underscore underscore init is a function and it lives in some place within memory. 
here's where my doc string is, here's the current value of the bare num, etc. Any questions about this? Um, name is, the, so name is not there, it's accessible to you because you're doing this special thing right here. Um, these are, I think these are ones that essentially get built up. Uh, there should be, well, surprise there's not a name, but you know that this exists if you need to grab it. There is a way sort of to hide things inside of classes, the concept of some sort of private variable that's only accessible from within an instance. It's not accessible outside of that. Um, there are other uh, programming languages where you can actually do this, but in Python, you can't ever make anything uh, uh, fully, fully private. And you do this by creating an attribute which has got a double underscore and no underscore after it. Um, and this is, probably you'll never need to do this, but this is one way if you, if you ever did. By the way, this def should be at the same level as this secret count. So I'm going to create a counter, um, and I'm going to increment this counter, and I'm going to print out the value of the counter. Um, and you notice I don't have an init here, right? So it's not like when I create this, anything actually happens. I'm just creating a pointer to this, to this sort of instance in memory. Counter equals just counter. So here I go. I've created my instance of a just counter. And I say counter count. One, two. And now, before, if I ever wanted to get access to, remember we did like, you know, uh, y dot name or c dot name, and that actually made sense? Now, there's really nothing different between this and, say, name equals or bare num equals, except because I have this double underscore, the interpreter will say, I don't know what you're talking about. But it turns out you can actually get access to that if you know the name of the class and you put an underscore name of the class, double underscore the name of the, of the variable. Very, uh, uh, very rarely will you ever need to use it. I want to say a couple things about referencing. I started using the word pointer. I said I wasn't going to use that very often in this class. I think it's really helpful to see this now that we've got essentially the most complex data type you can imagine, right? This isn't just something that has data associated with it or attributes. It's got functions. It knows how to do other things with other versions of itself. This is a pretty complicated object. So I want you to understand how these things live in memory and how Python thinks of these things. A equals bare yogi, if I just print A, we've seen this before, right? This is more or less just saying this is a pointer to some place in memory. B equals A. B is now referencing the same memory location that A is referencing. And you notice that these two things are identical. I'm going to set the name of uh, A to fuzzy. And what do you think happens when I ask what B's name is? Fuzzy. If I ask what the bare num is, that's number one. Even though I created what looks like another bear, it's still pointing to the same place. I never actually called an init function of the bear class because I never instantiated something. I just created a new pointer to something that already existed. Um, okay, so let me uh, introduce you to another module called copy, and it does things like copy stuff. Um, and it's good at copying things uh, from memory and essentially making exact replication of that uh, from memory and give you essentially a new exact version of that, um, but living in a different place within memory. So if I create a new bear, which is a copy of A, and I want to know where it's pointing, it's actually pointing in a different location than A and B, okay? So whatever, ha whatever A has, whatever attributes it has, whatever function it has, it is creating a copy of that and moving that over. What's the bare now? It's still one, right? I haven't, I haven't instantiated a new bare yet. I just keep doing copies of them for the same one. What's the name of C? fuzzy, because it had the name already from what uh, the uh, A had and B had. Now if I say C dot name is smelly, funny bear, um, what do you think A's name is? Fuzzy, 
Right, exactly. Because all I did is I messed around with the, um, the basically the reference pointing to an instance that looks a whole lot like uh, fuzzy, but I changed its name. And since this is in a different memory location than where A is, even though they used to be identical, now they're actually different from each other because I actually overwrote and said what um, uh, C's name was. Well, what if you changed B's name? What if I changed B's name? Um, well, so if I change B's name, A's name would change. Um, so basically, if I said B name equals um, Fonzi, then um, A's name would change, but C's name would not change. Now let's get into, now that you've got that, we're going to go another, another level deeper with referencing. Let me create a new attribute. By the way, I didn't have to instantiate uh, this attribute when I was creating um, Yogi or Fuzzy. I can just say, I'm creating a new variable inside of this instance, and I'm going to call it my list. My list is going to be one, two, three. What do you think C my list is currently? I don't know what that is. So basically, um, C, as again, is, is pointing to this new uh, copy of A. I can start doing whatever I want to C without really touching A. So here I've touched A, and I haven't really done anything to C. Okay? So let me make another copy of A. And remember, now A has not just a name. It's still fuzzy. But it now also has this new attribute called my list. What's my list going to be for D? One, two, three. Because it faithfully copied all these different things, right, from A. Uh, D.name, what is that going to be? Fuzzy. Um, let me set D.name equal to Yogi. What's A's name? Still fuzzy, right? Because D is pointing off to a different place. OK, now I get a little evil. I'm going to change A. I'm going to change the first element of A to be minus 1 and not 1. What is D's list going to look like? Is it 1, 2, 3? No. Ah, this whole idea that we just made this nice copy of A, and we, and we basically put it in another place in memory with D, what happened is I basically just copied either the data attributes themselves, or if these are mutable objects or functions, I basically copied references to the location of where that other data lives. This list lives somewhere in memory. And what I did when I copied A over to D is I copied its name over. But I also copied over this thing called my list. My list within D is still pointing to the same location that A's my list is pointing to in memory. The way you get around that is you do something called deep copy. Um, this is what brought down the Nixon administration. <laughs> um, so now in, I'm creating a new bear, right? And um, this is essentially a direct copy of A. I'm going to set A's uh, first element to A. E, my list, will be preserved from what it was before. Yes? Um, that's not me if you change B. If you decide if you change B, A will change. And if you change B, B will change. Well, so if I change, so B also has a notion now, even though I didn't explicitly do this, B also has a notion of what my list is. Because B is pointing to the same memory location of A. So as A winds up changing and morphing, everything that's pointing to the same place, even if I'm calling it something else, still sees that same object, right? It still sees all of its data attributes. So that's the answer to the first part of the question. What was the second part? Uh, right, so if you change B, then like if you change my list to B, if you change B dot my list, yep. will it change D dot my list? Will it change D dot my list? Yes. Right, exactly. So Strings have methods, and lists have methods. So in a sense, they're classes as well. Yeah. But when you make a string, you put it to another string or list, to another list, it doesn't work that way. It works. It seems to work. That yeah, so you're, you're curious. Why is it that this works sometimes, and why is it that you're doing pointers other times? Right. Um, I think the cleanest way to say that is if it is a mutable object, then um, you pass references around. If it is not a mutable object, like it's an int, 
or a float or a string. Remember, strings are not mutable. They have methods on them, but when you mess around with the internals of what's in a string, you're actually getting back a new version of that string. Unlike a list where you're saying change element five, you're actually going into memory, changing the element in five in memory, but that you're still pointing to the same exact place in memory from, from your very... So it's important to know. So objects, um, functions, um, mutable data, things like, um, like sets, like lists, um, will wind up being uh, pointed to. And so you have to do a deep copy to make sure that you're getting all of those. And then what this does is it basically traverses down the entire sort of referencing tree. And it will make a copy of every single thing that it finds. So if I had a tuple, for instance, that is immutable. So that just gets directly copied over. I don't know what happens if you have a tuple of lists. I think that is considered uh, immutable. And inside of that uh, object are these two other pointers basically pointing to lists, which themselves are mutable. So a deep copy would go through and actually just say, I'm making copies of everything. You notice through all of this, I never instantiated another bear. So if I type bear num now, I'd still get one. Yeah. Um, is it, so the question is, is it possible to copy to a file um, and, uh, and not, uh, not into memory? The answer is yes, but it's not super native in Python to do that. You basically have to say how you want to contain that file. And you want to basically preserve it forever. So that's Python's clever way of saying you've got a pickle, right? And you want to stick something into a pickle jar. And in fact, there's a module called pickle, which is take a Python object, pack it up in some clever way, and store it in a very compact binary representation of that object. And then it actually saves it a string, or you can dump it directly to a file. If you want to, you can pull that, you read from that file, and open it up as a, as a binary, and read it back in, and essentially unpickle things. So that is one reasonable way to pass around. So if you create this awesome, in the, uh, you know, this awesome object, right, and it's got all these, you've got a list of, 55 really cool instances, and you'd love to pass those around to your friends and send them a file. Pretty much what you'd wind up doing is pickling the list of all of those things. And if, if it's a normal Python object, and it doesn't have anything too funky associated with it, like it isn't also only valid if there's a file that's open, so, you know, stuff like that, um, then probably uh, pickle is going to work. It's not considered a great way to archive data. Typically, what you'll want to do is kind of spit out what's inside of um, your object that you care about, save that to disk, and write a little function that sort of repopulates everything based on the, the data that you need. Um, but pickle generally is, is the way to go. If you're dealing with large data files, so you've just done this awesome uh, you know, matrix manipulation, and you've got to make sure that you're saving the exact state of that, there are things to do within NumPy. There's something called um, um, MP save or just MPZ, which saves it in a very compact way. The problem with pickle is that it's not um, architecture independent, and the, uh, the essentially the codex of pickle is still changing a little bit. So you can get a very uh, you can get a very large file version that will basically persist forever, and you could read this in in a hundred years from now probably. But the really compact versions of these things will wind up being volatile across different um, platforms, across um, different versions. If you delete A, what does P of A and P of minus? If I delete A, yes. um, so if I delete A, I will wind up, um, I will wind up uh, calling, sorry, if I delete A, that's not going to be a problem. And I won't actually call the del on A. And the reason being is that the del gets called when I wind up having uh, no more references remaining to that object. As long as you're still pointing to that instance, you're not going to wind up calling del. You could delete A, but then still have things. I could still have B. No, no, as long as B is still around, I'm OK. C, D, and E, in the way that I've constructed this, um, are basically considered different. And so if I called del C, I would, pull, I would basically run the del on, on, uh, on C and pull that whole thing down. OK, um, let me talk about subclasses. Um, 
what we've been doing when we created this thing called bear is we basically just said class bear and then uh, colon. What we should do is actually say class bear and then parentheses object. Because all these things that we're creating are actually subclasses of a class called object. Um, and what does it mean sort of conceptually to have um, a subclass? The idea is that you might have a class of something called plant, right? And plant um, knows the rate at which it grows. Um, it knows the environment that it likes to live in. But flowers are different than plants. They're a subclass of plants. And they have their own things. They may have different methods, right? How to pollinate, um, how many petals should I have as I grow up, right? Um, so this is uh, very succinctly how you should be thinking about classes. Um, oftentimes, as you're actually building up uh, many different types of classes, and the concept of, uh, with bears is that perhaps you want to start off with animals. And animals generically know how to procreate with other animals, but bears perhaps have special things about how they like to walk around in the forest. You would create, um, if you're going to create a whole zoo, you would create perhaps um, a uh, class of uh, animals, and then you would create a whole bunch of subclasses, bears and zebras and whatever, and they'd have their own special attributes, but they more or less share all the other things from um, the class above them. Attributes of the base class are inherited by the subclass. So we call the thing above this, so in this case, this would be called the base class, and this is called the subclass. And to be sort of say this in the Pythonic way, the class flower is a subclass of the base class plant. Um, the plant itself may be a base class, um, uh, maybe a subclass of a base called living thing, right? So um, I think I've got uh, some code in here as well to show this stuff off, but you don't really have to play around with it now, just to get you uh, familiar with the concept. So you have a plant, and we've got sort of the total number known, and this is going to become the base class. We've got a Latin name, a common name, and we're going to bump up every time there is a new instance, we're going to wind up uh, bumping up the, uh, uh, the total number of plants. Then I'll create a subclass of plant, which we'll call a flower. And um, we're basically going to add one attribute. We're going to say it has petals. And I could obviously say this flower doesn't have petals. So P equals plant uh, poison ivy. E equals flower poppy. E has petals. That's true, just because that's how it gets created. By the way, there's no init here. What init do you think is getting run when I instantiate a subclass of the uh, base class plant? The plant init is getting run. If I don't overwrite anything inside of a subclass, its parent class gets uh, used, right? So if I define an underscore underscore str inside the plant class, whenever I called you know, print, uh, you know, uh, print e, it would use the parent class str str. Is there a question out there? No, it only runs the flower in it, but then inside the flower in it, you could say, oh, and I might as well also just run the, uh, the uh, plant in it as well. I'll show an example of that. But this is the point. When we, when we say underscore, underscore, add inside of our bear class stuff, what we're really doing is we're overriding the add um, method of, um, of essentially the object class. And because if we don't give it parentheses object as our base class, we wind up more or less implicitly saying that this class I just created is a subclass of the class object. Um, how many plants are known? Two. Even though I only created an instance of one plant, because flower is a base class, is a subclass of, of the plant base class, and I actually ran its in it. Inside of its in it, I bumped up the total number of plants now. If I go to flower and I ask the, for the bases, and this is going to wind up being a list, and I ask for what that name is, that's a plant. So flower dot underscore underscore bases is a list, and it tells you all the different base classes of a given subclass. And then I can ask for the name of that. 
Any questions about that? Yeah. The hash pedals, is that an attribute of, of the that of that of E or is that an attribute of that class? It's like sort of like the population that we actually there. Yeah, so um, so it is actually an attribute of the entire, it's an attribute of the entire uh, base class, or subclass, excuse me. Okay, let's do something a little bit more interesting. As I said before, I could create, an, uh, I could create a string method inside of the plant, and now um, you wind up seeing that I'll also create a string method inside of the flower. If I create a flower, I'm going to use this one's um, str and not this one's str because I've overwritten it, right? The subclass methods take precedence over the base class. I'm a flower. And if I say plant, oak, I'm a plant, oak, okay? So there's some of this stuff is in subclass.py. Um, we're not gonna go into great detail beyond what you're seeing right here, and we really won't ask you to be um, coding up a lot of this stuff. So just to give you a generic sense of, um, of how we do these subclasses. This is really the answer to the question that we had up in the corner of, let's say you really want to run the init of the base class. How do you do that? Well, inside of the init, because I'm overriding now, this init is basically overriding the base classes in it, but I really want to use the base classes in it as well. I want to grab all the functionality that the base class gives me um, by running its init. Um, then uh, you basically just call it. And you have to pass it with this self right here. One of the few times when you're actually passing in a function the word self, but now you're passing it back up to the base class. Okay, so we can still use the parents um, in it. F equals flower rose, print that, I'm a flower. F dot n petals, uh, five, because that was part of my in it, and et cetera, et cetera. There is bolt, there's a sense of multiple inheritance, right? So I already told you that you know flower uh, is a, is a subclass of the base class um, plant. Plant itself could be a base class, a subclass of the base class uh, living thing. But now flower may also be um, a subclass of a couple other base classes: plant, edible foods, and smelly stuff. Each one of which has their own methods, has their own attributes. And when I pull all these things in, Python has sort of a established uh, ordering of how their different inits are going to want to be called and how their different um, attributes are going to want to be populated in this, in this uh, instance. So flower one is searched first. So if I've got an init, I run that. Um, if I've got you know, a number of petals equals five, it will set that thing up. Then it goes to plant, then it goes to edible food, and then it goes to smelly stuff and its base classes and their base classes and blah, 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 right? So I think they figured out a way for this not to be totally cyclic and just run forever if you've made some uh, mistake like this. Um, but it's also sensible. So if smelly stuff decides in the end that it wants to set um, n petals equal to, to seven, then when I'm done and I've finished sort of building this whole um, instance up, n petals will equal seven because it effectively gets executed last. Yeah. Isn't it that it, search, it looks for a thin flower and if it doesn't find something that looks in plant and if it doesn't find something that looks in edible food rather than it runs them all? Because you just said it runs the init of the flower and then if you want the others, you have to explain. I think that's one. true for methods. I'm not sure exactly if that's true for attributes. So I think if I overwrite an attribute, I think it actually will take the stuff at the very end. Although, you you yeah, no, no, that doesn't make sense. No, I'm wrong about that. You're right. I'm wrong. Yeah, it's not just it's not just attributes. Okay, so what's up here is correct. I just said it wrong. Um, it will look in these things, and if it finds something, it will it will essentially establish that. And unlike when you're running, say, a script where you say n petals equals five, and at the very bottom you say n petals equals seven. At the end, the end state of that is n petals equals seven. You're, you're right that it has to be this way, um, that when you find n petals equals five, that's what it is. Okay, so a little bit more about um, error and error handling. Um, we saw all this stuff before. We've got some volatile code. We've got an exception. We've got a finally. There's lots of different types of exceptions that can be thrown. And this except basically catches all exceptions. 
but there's lots and lots and lots of different types of exceptions, and they're all interrelated to each other, and they're all interrelated to each other through object inheritance. So 3.1415 divided by zero is a zero division error. And we can handle different types of exceptions in different ways. Um, this is some function that's gonna wind up failing. This fails. Um, we're going to try this fails, except if I get a division error, um, I'm gonna sort of save the results of that in this thing called detail, and then I'm gonna print that stuff out. Handling runtime error division uh, or modulo by zero. So I actually caught explicitly the division error. If for some reason inside of here I did something else, like I try to open a file that didn't exist, I would throw a different error. And because I haven't explicitly caught that error, that error would be allowed to pass through and sort of go up to the stack. And we'd see it basically at the command level. Um, if you want to create your own exceptions, you import exceptions and then you create a subclass of the base class exception. But you could also create a subclass of the base class warning. Or what they've done for you is they've created the ability to do a user warning and they've, given, they've overloaded this with some method, so it makes it a lot easier. Um, here's a divide, uh, x divided by y. Here's a division error, let me catch that. Um, here's the result, and I've finally done the last clause here, two divided by one, two divided by zero, and you see here is where we're executing finally. Uh, string two, string one, fin ex executing finally cause, but I got a trace back. Yeah? Say that again? Um, uh, yes. How does the thing go? How does it go? Uh, sorry, I'm not, I'm not seeing what you're asking for. So we saw the thing that the sample had five exception points and now there is an intense flaw. Would that be okay if you could the call this permeation? Yeah, so this try, this will execute. If this works, it'll then, it'll wind up basically giving us this. And then, regardless, it will wind up giving us finally. But if there's an error that's not caught by this, then we'll wind up executing the finally clause and then pass the error back up higher up in the stack. So no matter what happens, the finally will be executed. Yes. It has more than one clause. Yes, we'll do that right now. So we'll catch multiple errors. Um, we're going to try to open up a file. I'm going to catch the IO error. So basically, if I try to open up a file that doesn't exist, if I try to open up, um, I basically try to convert what's in that file to something that can't be converted. Like if I have the word spam inside that file and I've read that in and I try to convert that to an integer, that's also volatile, that's not gonna work. And then I can catch everything else. And there's this thing called exec info which basically keeps track of all the exceptions um, that are in the, uh, that are in the uh, exception trees. Again, you can see some of the functionality of this in catch error. You can create a file for yourself and see what happens um, under different use cases. And um, there's something new here. This is called raise. And this is basically like saying, OK, we have a problem. Don't pass this on anywhere. Just raise it to the interpreter and let the interpreter deal with it. So it allows me to basically raise that exception and not just sort of pass it on. I can also, um, by the way, you notice, I had an exception, I caught it, and it would, it would have just gone on gracefully, but here I'm just saying, okay, even though you caught it, print stuff out that I wanna see, but make that exception be known to the interpreter. If I didn't have a raise here like we didn't have here, so here, me, this is me just saying, eh, I don't really care, just keep on going. This is me saying, I don't care if I can't convert it, keep on going. But if it's the kind of exception that I'm not expecting, then I perhaps want to raise that and make sure that that gets caught during the debugging stages. Yeah? Um, no, so these are actually built in. So you, you have access to these things, um, uh, but if you want to actually start changing them and overloading them, you have to import exceptions and then play around with them. But you have access to these things. It's a good question. I wasn't clear about it. 
you have access to these things directly within the interpreter. We can raise um, exceptions from within our own code. Um, and this can be caught upstream. So A equals cat food if A is not equal to spam. I want to raise a name error. I decided this, for me, is what I consider uh, an exception of class um, name error. And anything that isn't spam breaks my code. So I just raise that error. And I can have whatever error message I want to have there. I could raise an IO error. I could raise a system error. I could raise any one of the well-defined errors. And if I create my own errors, I can raise those as well. So here is um, sort of an uh, ASCII representation of the inheritance of all these different errors. And they are classes and subclasses. So every unbound local error is also a name error, which itself is also a standard error, which is also an exception. So if I'm catching all uh, exceptions of class exception, then anything that's inside of here, I'll wind up catching. If I only class, uh, you know, catch non, uh, not implemented error, and I actually have a runtime error, then I won't actually catch this because this is a subclass of all name errors. Oh, sorry, it's a subclass of all not implemented. Error. Yeah. It would be like four lines of Python to actually print this out yourself, right? If you just walk down the exceptions tree and you just ask that question of who are the, what are the base classes? Start off with one class, right? Actually, start off with one of these things and then just walk up and down the trees and you can probably print it out. Maybe that'll be your homework. Okay, let's create our own exceptions. So I'm going to create a my error class. And I'm going to make it a subclass of the base class exception. Um, I'll have an init. I'm going to call exceptions in it. I'll have a value associated with this thing, and this gets passed on to me. Exception with blah at time blah. I'll have a string and said you said this. Let's see how we would actually wind up using this. I'll raise my error, darn it. My error, you said darn it. So the name of the class is printed first, and then um, whatever this string is uh, will wind up being shown. And the thing at the top will be um, when this basically gets called, we'll basically call this init, and we find out exactly what time this is. So this is pretty useful. If you're going to be printing out lots of stuff to some file, and you're not sure when things are breaking, you might catch your errors, but you might also um, you know, essentially decorate them a little bit, and make them look a little bit nicer. Yeah. Is there any good programming practice of what you make a subclass of? Is it typically exception? Yeah, you almost always just make it an exception. Unless you know the things that you're really interested in are um, input-output error. So if that's where most of your bugs are popping up and you're really not seeing the kind of information you need to see in your output, you might make a new, um, a new uh, uh, subclass of, say, an I.O. error. Um, exception class. Okay, um, so that's it. What we're going to do now is um, have you work on the breakout session from the last session that we didn't actually show to you. Um, do I have this? Air bears. <coughs> All right, you get to see my calendar ID. And my password is dot, 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 dot. So. Here it is. Here's the breakout session. Um, OK, so you're going to get into object-oriented programming. Calculate the perimeter um, and area, if you can, for polygon provided uh, given the uh, vector coordinates in order of its n vertices. So you'll be given this location, this location, this location. And you want to sum over the distance between adjacent points. 
um, where the distance is basically going to wind up being the, the, um, the square of the uh, differences in the x and the y. And that is, you want your functionality of your code to look something like this. A equals polygon, so you here you're instantiating a um, instance of a class of something which we'll call polygon. And here are the different vertices. And I want to say A dot perimeter. Now, if you said A dot perimeter without the um, parentheses, effectively you'd be saying that perimeter is an attribute. And the only way in which it could become an attribute and have it have any real meaning is that inside of the init of the polygon class, you would have to call some other method um, that knows how to calculate the perimeter. In this case, we're just asking you to create a method which is called perimeter. And every time you call it, you wind up calculating the perimeter. Um, you could be graceful and say, has this um, variable been set yet? Or is it something other than minus 1? And if so, just return that value. Otherwise, do the math. Um, if you want, do something with an area. And then if you want to test how well your code's doing, um, create another instance and put in these vertices, and that should be the answer. OK, so obviously, you're going to do this with um, uh, you're going to be doing this with object-oriented programming. Um, the first line of your code will be class, space, polygon, colon, and then the rest is up to you.